Hello, my cool team friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 54 of the podcast. And today I'm asking a simple question. Is this quilt cheating? <laughs> so this was a suggestion I got quite a lot for a great quilting debate. Uh, and that is what techniques are cheating? Whether you use fusible web or an embroidery machine or automation on a long arm, all of these different little things can sometimes start uh, bringing out that uh, judgment zone for a lot of quilters of, oh, well, she cheated, you know, that's not really talent, that's not really skill, that kind of thing. And so I want to take on this great quilting debate and what I think is cheating when it comes to making a quilt. Just a little hint, absolutely nothing. I don't think there's a single way that you can make a quilt and it not be a quilt. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I don't know. I guess I have a very open, very permissive mentality, and I'm going to share a lot about that and why I believe the way I do, because I've had some experience over the years with other crafts that have gotten into getting ruined. So I can't wait to share with you about this and share some quilts along the way. I brought several out here to the Crafty Cottage with me so it can be a little bit of a show and tell and uh, talk about the different, and it can really kind of dig into and analyze the different judgments that we can have once we understand how a quilt is made and then also investigate that. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the process uh, and kind of where those thoughts are coming from. Sometimes the way we're taught uh, and the opinions of the person that taught us first can really influence us for many, many years uh, after the fact. So I think it's a really interesting debate and certainly a topic that is near and dear to my heart because I personally believe in keeping your crafting and quilting world as open and permissive as possible. So I can't wait to take this on and talk more about, is this quilt cheating? <laughs> okay, so I am sure you are wondering what's going on in the Crafty Cottage today. First off, it is raining, so it's a little loud in here. Uh, and I apologize for that, but it's one of those days where I just, I knew I needed to get here and show you what I'm working on. And I am working on cleaning a treadle base. So just in case you're listening to the podcast audio, please know that there's also video and you can come and check out what I'm working on. And you can see me scrubbing down a treadle base. And this is like the irons uh, for a treadle. And so I bought this one just recently and this is actually in wonderful shape and it'll even treadle for you. See how nice that movement is. <laughs> So something you might not know is that when you buy a treadle, you can take it apart and you can take it apart really, really easily. And in fact, actually next week, we have an excellent podcast episode coming up that's all about vintage machines and treadles. And I talk a lot with a very, very awesome quilter about this. So be looking forward to next week. Uh, and I was, I was hoping to kind of time all of this at the same time, just so that way it would really make sense. Because uh, this is something that I'm getting into and I'm really intrigued about. And when I'm intrigued about something, I want to share it. You know, I want to learn more about it. I want to dig into it and I want to share more about it. So I am going to be sharing some videos just on how to clean a treadle base and, uh, you know, kind of the step-by-step -step process. But real basically, all I'm doing is I've got uh, one of my leftover spray starch bottles, filled it up with water and a sponge. And I'm just wiping this guy down. He's just a little dusty, just a little dirty. And I'm just wiping it down. Got some stuff here behind me. And uh, getting all the dust and grime off. You know, a lot of times a treadle would be positioned near the kitchen or, you know, in near a door or something like that. And it's just gonna pick up dirt and grime over the years. And most people didn't think to go and scrub that down. Uh, so, you know, that's just one of those things that I think when you get one, go on ahead and take it apart. It's just four screws that attach the treadle base, the irons to the top, to the cabinet. And so it was just four screws took those off and was able to take the heaviest part of the treadle off and be able to clean them. And I should say, I have, this is actually my second treadle. <laughs> I've got another one in the barn that's in a lot worse shape, that's totally rusted. And I actually took that one outside with a water hose and actually sprayed it off and scrubbed it outside uh, because it was just so funky monkey. You know, it was just not something I wanted to even bring in the crafty cottage, it was too dirty. Um, so if it's in a really bad rusted kind of nasty state, then certainly consider that that's open to you to just take it outside and spray it down with a water hose. Uh, uh, this one is 
been kept up in such great condition. Uh, it was kept in one family, which is really exciting. And uh, yeah, and, and in the house the whole time. The other one that I have is a Singer 12, and I'm pretty sure it was kept out in an old barn, got wet, got rained on, got bugs in it, all that good stuff. And that one's uh, gonna be a lot more work to put back together again. So while I'm scrubbing this thing down and getting all of the dust off of it, um, I'm gonna tell you about what's going on this week. So a lot of different things are going on as usual. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to there being a podcast episode where I'm like, yeah, nothing's going on. <laughs> it's never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's never going to happen. So this week I shared the fourth post for Prison Path and it's all about quilt marking. So if you're looking for a way to really start to understand the quilting process and to understand the design process, my advice to you would be to start marking your quilts. That's just step number one, basically. Uh, and you don't even have to do anything more complicated than mark some lines over it. But marking the quilt top forces you to take a look at it and to decide where those lines are gonna go. You know, you're gonna decide, okay, do I want those lines to run horizontal or vertical? Do I want those lines to run with the piecing or against the piecing? So by marking the quilting design, you're thinking about those decisions a little bit more than you probably would have if you just based it and go straight to the quilting process. And it forced you to look at it and analyze it and, and make up your mind about what you want more than anything else. And so um, a lot of times, actually one of the number one suggestions I've had for new videos is on quilting design choice. How do you pick the right design for any particular quilt? And so I'm gonna be really working on that, trying to message that a little bit more, trying to make more videos that make that more clear, because I've definitely taught the designs. You know, we've got nearly 500 designs for you to learn uh, in the Free Motion Quilting Gallery. But as far as using those designs in real quilts, that's where things can get tricky. So I think number one, start marking your quilts. So this Prism 4, so it's leahday.com slash Prism 4, and that's P-R-I-S-M and the number four. So come and check that out, and that's all about quilt marking. And I'm just marking two designs, some straight lines and matrix over the quilt. Matrix is just a wiggly grid. So it's really simple. And, but I go into a lot of detail, as usual. <laughs> I can't just be like, all right, we're gonna mark it and be done with it, no. Uh, I do, do share a lot of details, most specifically about marking pens and pencils because they are not all created equally. Um, they're not all the same. Some of them will not wash out of your quilts and that is devastating. I had that happen once where I was working on a super important show quilt and then the marks didn't come out you know, and, and they're still in it <laughs> even now. So um, you don't want to have that happen. And the, and the key there is testing your marking pens. And I also shared an image from washing out Infinity Knot. And a lot of people have had bad experiences with water soluble blue pens, the kind that I love. And there's always, you know, I almost, there was once I, I taught at a quilt guild. And when I said, told everybody the pen I use, I kind of got a, like a collective shudder <laughs> went through the room. And I, you know, and what I found whenever I asked people about it, they weren't using it properly. So when you use a water soluble blue pen, you have got to wash it out completely, which means soaking your quilt in the bathtub, uh, not spraying the surface with water, not getting a little bit wet. That's only going to disperse the marks. It's not going to actually wash them out. So yeah, made that really clear and it's a great post. So I hope you'll come and check that out at leahday.com. Uh, and then you can also find the new post for our machine quilting design for the week and that was concentric circles. And this is a design that you really wanna use when you're in the mood to go a little over the top with your quilt. When you're wanting to show that you spent a little extra time, actually not just a little, a lot of extra time and a lot of extra energy to get those circles marked and quilted perfectly with a little bit of space with the, between each circle and a thread break with each circle. So there's two different designs I consider. Um, circles within circles, you know, with the thread break between each one, I call those concentric circles. And then there's UFO, and I shared the video for both of them on this post, so you can see both. 
UFOs when you use a little escape hatch <laughs> and you don't break thread with every single circle. And so of course that makes it a lot faster and a lot easier to quilt. So check it out, leahday.com slash circles. You can check it out. And uh, yeah, that's a great tutorial. The circles video is on walking foot quilting and then the UFO video is with free motion quilting. So that's another thing I've been really trying to share more about every week. And that is to show um, there's not one type of quilting, there's multiple types of quilting and each one does something, um, something different. And some of, sometimes I would choose free motion quilting for a specific design and sometimes I would choose walking foot quilting for a specific design. And there's different reasons why you would pick those and I'm, I'm really hoping to uh, share more about that and that decision making process. But basically with walking foot quilting, you know, the thing, the advantages are you can really easily space lines. You can use the guide on the walking foot. You can use the walking foot base to really easily space lines without having to mark it. With free motion quilting, you're able to move the quilt faster. You're able to slide it around and get it in position faster and you don't have to do so much direction change. Now with circles in particular, I would say you probably want, once it gets big, you wanna rotate the quilt all the way around because I would struggle to quilt circles smoothly with free motion quilting because it can go really wobbly really quick, really easily. So I would almost say that the bigger circles are easier to quilt with walking foot style quilting. So it just interesting little things like that. I love sharing, you know, uh, kind of my, um, my knowledge about machine quilting and kind of how I geek out about it. And I love being able to share multiple videos in a tutorial because it's fun to show you, you know, the different styles and techniques. So yeah, I hope you'll check that out too. And then what else is going on? Well, obviously the treadles, kind of a new thing. Started playing around with this, started shooting videos on those. Definitely still busy with Mally the Maker, and that is still going. I mean, it's just, I try and get as much done on the book. And so if you haven't been listening to the podcast, Mally the Maker is a fiction novel about a little girl and a quilt and her grandma. And I'm hoping that this will be, that I will be finished with the editing process and be listening to the book all the way through um, by May. I'm really, really hoping that but it is going a lot slower than I expected. And the main reason for that is, um, I didn't realize this about the editing process. When you're writing, you can kind of write a section and kind of, you know, you know what happened, but you kind of leave it behind. And then you go to the next section, you write that section and you leave it behind. With editing, you kind of need the entire book in your brain. Um, and if you can't keep it all in your brain, then you have to constantly cross-reference. Okay, where was Miss Bunny sitting? Was she on Mally's shoulder? Was she in the backpack? I mean, like, I find myself having to cross-reference stuff. Like, that's what I was cross-referencing this morning. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Was she sitting on her shoulder or in the backpack? And so, you know, then it's browsing through and finding that page and then, oh, okay, well, that wasn't clear. Maybe she should be doing something else. And then I'm realizing, you know, all of the stuff is happening, but no one's saying anything or all this stuff is happening, but it's only Mally that's talking, or all this stuff is happening, but it's, we're only you know understanding what's happening to Mally, the little girl, not anybody else. So it's just a continual process of, okay, this is going on here, what, is ev what, is, what else is happening? What else is going on? Ooh, that's loud. So that's me moving the treadle around. I'm trying to get around to the back side here so that way I can wipe down the inside. And yeah, I'm getting a whole lot of funk stuff off the side, but it's really just dust. You know, it's not really even all that grimy. So I do feel like I just have to keep a lot more of the book in my brain at any given time. Uh, and that feels just a little bit more intense. And I guess that was really what I wasn't expecting about the editing process. And it's interesting, I was talking to Josh about it. Josh has written multiple novels over the years. He hasn't published them. Maybe we can get a little encouragement for Josh to publish his novels, that would be great. But um, he has had a lot of experience writing and, uh, and he liked the editing process quite a bit because you, know, you get that intense, perspective on the entire book, you know, chapter by chapter, scene by scene. Uh, and I enjoy it too, I'm just not used to it. And I think that's, that's the key, it's just experience, it's just getting, 
getting into it, getting to know how this whole process works. And I was working fairly slowly because I would edit a chapter and then I'd go listen to it and then I'd edit it and listen to it. And I was really just getting stuck on chapter one and two and I had to keep moving. So I kind of put myself in jail and said, okay, I'm not allowed to listen to it again until I get the whole book done and gone through again, and then I can listen to it again and be listening for those issues. Uh, so I did get a lot of questions about the listening part of it. How am I listening to the book? Uh, there is an app that you can get for your phone, which I, I recommend the app over all the other systems that they have. It's called Natural Reader. And basically it is a synthesized computer voice, but it sounds relatively human enough to be passable, at least to me, and I'm a pretty picky audiobook person. I listen to audiobooks a lot, so I really like a good narrator. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And so I have, um, it's a $10 app. I think it's worth it. And you can upload any type of document. You can upload Word documents and PDFs. You can upload, uh, you know, can you kind of link it to, to different web pages. You know, whatever you want read to you, you can have read to you. And then uh, it will read in the vo voice you select. And it has different languages, not just English, too, which I found really cool. And I have uh, Sharon <laughs> read me the book. And it works. It really does work. Um, I have found, though, that I need to be... I need to be quilting on something that I can put half my brain into. And then I need to have the book printed out in a loose-leaf binder next to me so that as I'm quilting, I can stop when something happens and I'm like, uh, Mally doesn't need to say that. Or, oh, I'm repetitive on that word. I need to go change that word out. Because that's the thing, whenever I'm listening to an audiobook, that's exactly, I'm like, oh my gosh, did they just say door again? <laughs> and so I'm trying to catch those little things and go change it then. And I know that's, that's my weirdness about audiobooks. I know, you know, Josh could care less what an audiobook sounds like because he doesn't listen to audiobooks. But that's something that's important to me and that's how I consume fiction. So that's how I'm going to write my fiction. And yeah, I really enjoy listening to it. It's exciting to listen to. It'll be even better if I ever get a real audiobook narrator <laughs> to narrate it. Uh, I am thinking about reading it myself and maybe doing a podcast episode or two of that. I might, I might do more of that than that. I don't know. Well, I'll have to kind of play that by ear uh, as we get through this process. And that's been good. I'm trying, like I said, I'm trying to speed up just a bit by not reading, not going and, and setting it up to, to listen to it quite so often. And that's helped me speed up just a bit. And I'm kind of at the halfway point right now. Chapter seven is the halfway point and really the trickiest it just a lot of stuff happens in chapter seven. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of stuff happens in chapter seven. So I need to make sure that it's right and it's consistent. You know, I don't have uh, Miss Bunny running and then all of a sudden on Mally's shoulder, you know, something like that. So it's just getting all my ducks in a row, all my I's crossed and my T's dotted, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's what I've been mostly working on this week. And then I um, did want to start having a little feature, a little sale every week and to let you guys know about it because... You know, part of the podcast is to be able to share what's going on in real life, uh, but part of it also is to say, you know, I'm in business and I have a quilt shop that supports my family. And um, sometimes I find that I'll have somebody email me and they'll be like, I had no idea that you had a quilt shop or I had no idea that you wrote a book. <laughs> and I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> how, how can you possibly, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. Sometimes things can get missed and sometimes people can end up just on YouTube and not understand that we have any other places to go check out. So this week we have a really cute little feature and that is on the heart medallion fabric. So it is a one yard panel of blue heart medallions and green heart medallions. So they come bundled together and it's on sale this week for $19.99. Uh, so you get one yard each. And if you use the coupon code podcast at leahday.com, then you can save an additional 10% on your order. So I hope that you'll come that and check that out at leahday.com slash shop. That's where you can find our quilt shop and come and check out all of the different tools and supplies and books and patterns that we offer, as well as a little bit of fabric. I don't have a lot of fabric, but just a little bit here and there. So come and check that out at leahday.com slash shop. 
And now here's the show, the great quilting debate all about, is this quilt cheating? <laughs> Hello my quilting friends, my name is Leah Day and welcome to this great quilting debate. Is this quilt cheating? This is all about really analyzing the different judgments that we can have over patchwork and quilting and really kind of digging into what might be behind that. So let's start out first with the very first time that I ever heard about a quilt not being counted as a quilt. Uh, the first time I remember was uh, on a sewing forum. Actually, this was way back in the day. This is probably 2004, 2005. And uh, there were some different people talking about, well, this is how I make a blanket. And I described it to someone and she told me it wasn't a quilt. And then someone said, well, that absolutely is a quilt. And then someone else said, no, it's not. That can't be a quilt. So the definition of a quilt, as far as a quilt show goes, if you wanted to enter a quilt into a quilt show, the definition of a quilt is simply three layers, a top, a middle that has, is some sort of fluffy material, a batting, and can, that could be flannel, that could be uh, uh, cotton batting, polyester, wool, whatever. It can be any kind of fluffy stuff. Some of my grandmothers even used polyester blankets, like uh, the kind of micro plushy kind of blankets back in the 70s, that's what they would put in the middle of a quilt. And then of course backing. So you've got three layers, but the real kicker is stitches running through all three layers. So that's how a quilt show would define a quilt. So really anything that fits within that should count as a quilt. So nothing within that, uh, so long as you have three layers and stitching running through all three, then it's a quilt and therefore it's not cheating. But I think most of that cheating thing, that whole mentality really comes more from how was the quilt constructed and how was it put together? Because this is where we can start getting a little judgy and certainly a little uh, nitpicky in our process. So let's start first with kind of the origin of the craft and that is hand piecing. And there are still professional quilters that I know that all they do is hand piece and they're amazing at it. And obviously uh, feel like that is a very important part of the craft and very, and it's important enough to continue doing that uh, even now when machines obviously are made and you can get a really nice quarter inch seam piecing on a machine. So when you're piecing by hand, yes, do you get a, a greater connection with the fabric? Yeah, probably. Uh, when you're hand piecing, you can also kind of tweak your seam allowance just a little bit, just to make sure that you're getting just that exact perfect quarter inch seam. But are your stitches actually going to be as tight and secure as they would be if you did do that stitching on a machine? That's what's questionable. That's why a lot of people were taught to press seams to one side because that hand piecing seam, no matter how tiny and tight those stitches, uh, flattening out that seam is still just a little bit, it's just opening up to the batting area just a little bit too much. And for that reason, most of the time, whenever I hand piece, I press my seams to one side. So when machines came along and people started piecing by machine, then of course, I'm sure that there were a lot of people going, oh, well, you're, you know, now producing quilts so much faster and I'm still, you know, kind of doing my thing over here and it's slower, but maybe mine's better because I'm still going slow and maybe it's better because I'm still doing it the old way. Uh, and you know, that can kind of start to create some judgments, but I would hazard a guess that part of that judgment also had to do with money. And I know that's kind of can be sometimes a four letter word when it comes to crafters. Uh, and quilters because we don't want to think that money is involved in our craft or that um, that's affecting our decisions or our emotions, but it certainly can be. So let's say you have, you know, Betty Sue who can't afford a machine. She can't afford one. Her family just can't make that happen. Whereas you have Norma Jean who can, you know? And so Betty Sue doesn't even have that available to her. She has no option to get a machine. She's stuck hand sewing. And, you know, maybe a little bit out of shape about it. And so what's her opinion going to be about machine stitching? Probably not all that good. She's stuck hand stitching. She has no choice. She can't get a machine. Uh, she can't afford it. And that I think is more where the judgment can come in and, and more where that lies. And I've seen that situation 
repeated, even within myself. And so this is where this is a lot of this is coming from, is from my own judgments over the years and, and looking at a machine and saying, I can't afford that, therefore I don't need it. Or I can't afford that, therefore it's bad, it's cheating. So have you ever caught yourself doing that? You know, it's easy to walk through a quilt show and you're looking at all the beautiful quilts and maybe you're admiring one in particular and then you see machine embroidery. And instantly, you know, maybe your back kind of goes up a little bit like, oh, she didn't applique that. You know, she didn't sit there and take all the time to hand needle turn and do that satin stitching. She just hit a button on a machine, you know, she's cheating. Uh, there's no real talent in that. When really what might be behind that is, I would love to play on an embroidery machine. I would love to try that out but I don't even know where to start. And an embroidery machine seems like a really expensive investment. So there might actually be something behind that judgment, that instantaneous get you back up kind of judgment that it has nothing to do with the actual technique. And I felt that myself for a long time. So uh, I got really majorly serious about quilting in 2004, 2005. I dropped out of college. Uh, I was sewing all the time and I really wanted to make a stab at turning it into a business and I had no idea what that would look like. And for a while I thought that would be garment sewing and that's what I did for a year and a half is I sewed garments uh, professionally, 60 garments a week. And just chug them out, chug them out, chug them out, chug them out. And Josh and I were living in this itsy bitsy tiny little apartment and, uh, and I had this, you know, very small, uh, entry-level sewing machine. I bought a, a really cheap little serger that was allowing me to make these clothes and I was seeing all these things, you know, these beautiful quilts. I was seeing embroidery, uh, you know, those of course were still early days for embroidery, but still, you know, you were seeing these beautiful embroidery machines and stuff and it, you know, and it was like there was a wall between me and that because there was, there was what I could afford and what I was doing with what I had. And then there was this whole other realm of possibility where it was just like, I can't even touch that. I can't even want to get into that. I can't even like that uh, because it's, it's beyond my reach, you know? And it took me years to really start to analyze that and to dig into it and realize, you know, there's, there's other options, there's other possibilities. You know, there's machine financing <laughs> for one thing. Uh, and that, that was what I ended up doing uh, as the years went by, uh, even before I became a professional quilter, when I wanted really badly to try out a technique or to learn more about something and it wasn't available to me through the machine that I had, it was, okay, let's look at other options, let's investigate this. Let's see about machine financing and make that happen. Uh, and you know, and that's the thing, I think that's really important is to analyze this and go beyond just, you know, that instant judgment call. Uh, but let's also talk about sometimes the materials that can go into a quilt. So this is that little panel that I showed you earlier, and this is cheater cloth technically. So cheater cloth, it has cheater in the name. <laughs> You know, it's got the word cheat in the name. And so what that implies is uh, that you're somehow cheating because the design is printed on the fabric. So the heart medallions are batik uh, and that medallion design is printed directly onto the fabric so that you can just quilt it and it looks like that might have been really delicately appliqued or sometimes you can see you can find pieced. They look like they're a pieced quilt top when they're really just a cheater cloth panel. So is that cheating? Well, let's go back to that definition of a quilt. No, it's not cheating. If it's got three layers and you stitch through those three layers, then it's not cheating to use that. If that's a design that you like, and let's say you're cracking out baby quilts and you need to get something done in a hurry and you don't have time to piece 50 half square triangles together, using a cheater cloth panel is a viable way of getting the project done and creating that gift that you wanna give. I don't think that cheater cloth panels are a bad thing. Hey, I designed some <laughs> and 
I've designed multiple ones for Spoonflower too. Uh, I think that they're terrific because they save you the piecing process. If your goal is to practice quilting especially, then you don't want to mess with piecing something. You don't want to put a lot of time and energy in something because no matter how detached you are from it, as soon as your needle hits it, you're still going to be thinking about all that time and energy it took to piece that project. You know, if you really want to be able to detach and be able to quilt something with ugly stitches and not worry about what happens to it, then a cheater cloth panel is going to be your best way to go. But even though I call them cheater cloth panels, and even though that's what they are and cheater is in the name, I don't think that is cheating. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing, actually. Now let's talk about embroidery. That was really the one that kind of comes up a lot, I think, especially, you know, due to the price of machines more than anything else. Uh, I love machine embroidery, and it took me years to be able to say that. And really one particular class that I, I took on Craftsy with Eileen Roche, uh, because she described a machine embroiderer as someone who wants great results, they want a project to be done fast and efficiently, and so that they can enjoy it. And when I heard that, I was like, well, that's me. Why am, <laughs> why am I not calling myself a machine embroiderer? Uh, and, and that is exactly what it is. You know, you can depend on the machine to give you great results. If your design has been digitized well, then you're gonna have great results on that finished project. Now, does that mean that it doesn't require skill? That's oftentimes the criticism is, oh, well, she just slapped that on the machine and hit a button, you know, that wasn't hard at all actually getting into machine embroidery and watch some videos on it because it's not that easy. You have to learn about stabilizer. You have to learn how to hoop. For a long time, I struggled to do anything really well on my embroidery machines because I kept hooping all three layers, you know, quilt top, batting, and backing all in the hoop together. And that was a horrible mistake. Uh, so it took me a while to realize, oh, I only need to hoop one layer, the backing fabric, and then I can float or, or put in the middle and not put in the hoop the batting and top layer. And that made everything work out really well. So there is skill involved. This is still using a machine. This is still using and cutting up fabric. And it's still a lot of choices on design. You know, what fabric you use, what thread you use, and how those interplay together into your finished project. So I don't consider machine embroidery cheating. It's very efficient and it's wonderful to be able to finish a project, to go from start to finish in one day. Uh, and a lot of times I'll set up and have my machine embroidery uh, going, my, my embroidery machine going while I'm long arm quilting because they're in the same room. I can hear the machine ding and I know it's done and I'll switch stuff out while I'm on the long arm. It just creates a nice flow. Now let's go into long arm quilting. So this is one that's really fraught with a lot of, that's cheating. You know, having someone else quilt your quilt is cheating. Having someone else finish it for you is cheating. Having someone bind your quilt is cheating. Again, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Because you have to look at what, who made the quilt? You know, if you piece the top, you made the quilt. Now, there is an argument, however, and this goes back to, if, if we're gonna set a standard from quilt shows as far as the definition of what a quilt is, then we also need to set the definition from quilt shows as far as uh, ownership. And we're gonna get into this, I think, a little bit more in a future quilting debate, but if you have had your quilt quilted by someone else, you should give them credit. So you are the piecer and they are the quilter. So it's not cheating, but there is now a slight dual ownership of the quilt. You know, you own it, you own your half of it, you own your piecing, and the quilter, the long arm quilter that has done the quilting now, that's her craft, that's her art, that's on your quilt. And yes, I do think that you should give credit to your long arm quilter when you show a quilt that's been quilted by someone else. I think that's really important. It really helps her out a lot, especially if she's a local long armer in your area, it helps her out a lot. And it also reflects, you know, the truth about your quilt. But is it cheating? Absolutely not. It got the project finished. You know, it got it done so it could be used and enjoyed and appreciated. And that is also something else that's a little tied to money, you know, and a lot of quilters can feel a little negative about quilting by check. I've heard that and I didn't understand it for a little while. And then, you know, eventually it's like, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, you pay with a check, <laughs> you're a long armor, you know, and, and that kind of thing. 
Uh, but, you know, even within the long arm world, there's different levels of, of quilting. So there's the custom, the full custom quilting where, you know, basically you're kind of looking at every area of the quilt and saying, here, this place is going to get a design and here, this place is going to get a different design. And then there's automation, which basically turns the long arm into an embroidery machine where you can set up a digitized design and the machine will move itself so that it will move and stitch out that pattern and you need to come back in to advance the quilt through the frame, but you're not actually having to set and steer the machine yourself. So again, this is another situation where we can get in, oh, that machine did it all by itself. There was no skill involved, you know? I'm sure that you've heard that. I'm sure that you might have even experienced that yourself. I think that when it comes to quilt automation particularly, that is one where you know, please double check that you're going to get the finished look that you want. Because if you've taken the time to piece something really fabulous, you know, let's say you've taken the time to make a Dresden plate quilt and you've got those big, beautiful Dresden plate medallions, right? And then you pick an all over design that's loops that just stitches all over it, you know? That's not cheating and it's not breaking the rules, but is that really doing your piecing and quilting justice? Is that really doing your design justice? You know, it's not cheating, but it just might not be the best choice, if that makes sense. Okay, and so we go from automation and somebody else quilting your quilt, you know, and, and, and okay, so it's still yours, but there might be a little bit of a kind of a dual ownership thing kind of going on, especially if you show it, you're gonna need to give credit to your long armor. Uh, now finishers. Apparently, this is a whole other thing I didn't even know about, and that is when you have someone else bind your quilt for you. And I totally understand this. I have dad <laughs> bind most of my quilts now because he's gotten good enough at it that I, you know, I can hardly tell his binding from my binding anymore. Maybe a little bit on the corners, but really he's gotten good at it. I mean, I would like to live the rest of my life and never have to bind another quilt. I know exactly what that feels like, but is it cheating? Again, I don't think so. There are a lot of quilters that are writing to me almost every single week that are saying that they cannot physically do some of these things. They cannot physically move the quilt on their machine. You know, something's off on their shoulders or their hands or they're having trouble with their feet or they're having trouble with their legs. And we have to make the quilts we wanna make with the bodies that we have, with the limitations that we have. And if that means you cannot push the quilt through the machine and do binding, then it is perfectly fine. Even, even if you just hate the binding process, not even if you have a physical limitation, I'm saying if you hate the binding process, go and pass that off to somebody else if you want to. That is perfectly fine. Uh, I don't consider that cheating because in the end, it's still your quilt and it's still your craft and it's still finished. And you're still making something, you're still doing something, you're still actively engaged. And I also don't consider it cheating because you're still the one making all of the decisions. You decide on those quilting designs that you have your long armor do. You're deciding on that binding color that you're having somebody else attach. It's still yours because you're making all of the decisions and all of the de designs that go into it. So for all of those reasons, I don't consider it cheating. Now let me tell you a story about the craft that I had that was ruined because I was obsessed with this idea of cheating. The craft was beadwork. And I'm talking the tiny itsy bitsy little seed beads, the tiniest ones that you can get your hands on. And I, 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 I decided at some point, I don't know exactly when, but I made a decision that the only true beadwork were beads stitched together with thread. You could not stitch to fabric, that was cheating. You could not, just thread beads on a piece of wire. That was cheating. You could not uh, glue beads to anything. Oh my gosh, that is so cheating. <laughs> so uh, tiny little seed beads stitched together one by one. That was the only way that I believed you could do beadwork. And this was about the time when I was 16, 17 years old 
when I actually had the time to set and hand stitch one bead at a time because I was mostly doing that through class. <laughs> and so I would set and stitch these tiny little beads in class. And so, yeah, if I had the time to sit there and do that, then certainly I had the time to make that judgment call. But as soon as my life changed and my lifestyle changed and I could no longer had that time, I found all of a sudden that judgment that I was carrying around with me became a serious liability. And all of a sudden, the quilts that I, or sorry, quilts, the projects, the, the necklaces and bracelets and things that I was wanting to make, suddenly I couldn't make them because I didn't have time to do that anymore. Not that way, not that style. And when I was, when I did have time, I was mostly spending that ripping out something else I'd done. Because as the judgment of, oh, it must be this, this, and this in order to be counting as beadwork, all of those judgments kept adding up. They kept escalating. So it wasn't just one. It wasn't just, oh, you know, it, it can only be beads stitched together with thread. It then became, you can't mix this color with this color. And, oh, we can't have any of those big chunky beads. You know, it has to all be tiny itsy bitsy little seed beads. And then what ended up also happening is I got very bored, like bored to tears. And so everything I made looked the same and everything I made felt the same. And there was no movement. There was no growth. There was no learning. Because once you stick yourself in that box, that's as far as you can go. And everything else is cheating. Everything else is bad. Everything else is negative, right? And it took years. And I'm, I'm, I am thankful that I didn't trash my bead collection, that I didn't you know, give it away or sell it or throw it away uh, because beads are so small, I could keep them. Uh, and I held on to them and held on to them. And it's only now after many, many years that I'm able to go back to that and say, you know what? None of this is cheating. It is all good. It's all good as long as, you know, I'm enjoying myself and I'm making something that I want to make, then it is all good and it all works. You know, you know, and I think that's the thing about quilting that's different from beadwork is because this is so much bigger, you know, to think that there's actually an industry of, of people that can be supported quilting quilts for other people. That is huge. You know, in the equivalent of beadwork, that would be an entire group of people that are able to be employed just simply finishing off necklaces and bracelets, like just doing the clasp, you know? I mean, that would be the equivalent. Uh, so you, you've got to respect also just how amazing and solid the quilting industry is to be able to employ all of these people that can do all of these amazing things for you, such as quilting your quilt, or binding you, your quilt for you. And then all of the machines and all the machine capabilities that we have, this is not a negative thing. This is an amazing thing. We have machines that you can hit a button and stitch it out. You can embroider something without having to know how to do machine embroidery the old school way. And we have machines that you can stitch out a looby design over your quilt and go from edge to edge in five minutes you know, without even having the skill to do that design freehand. And that's okay too. You don't have to know how to do everything. One thing that I found really surprising whenever I put the long iron frame in my house, uh, almost instantaneously, I felt like, gosh, why didn't I do this years ago? You know, why didn't I make this decision, this change years ago? Because all of a sudden I have been cranking out quilts and able to move at such a greater pace and greater speed. Now, is my quilting perfect? Absolutely not. But I'm able to feel more productive. And a lot of the reason why I didn't make that move for so long is because I worried, kind of the, what will people think, you know, worry of, oh, you know, does this make me somehow different? It, I really took it into kind of an emotional area, you know, um, Will somebody, you know, think that I'm bad because I'm not quilting as much on my home sewing machine, you know, even though I am, you know, it's kind of 50-50, it's equal. Um, and it was interesting, only after getting the machine in place and starting to play on it did I realize that there is absolutely nothing to be emotional about. It's a machine. That's it. It's like getting emotional about a hammer. <laughs> Or, or a really good drill, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's really kind of silly, actually, when you look at it that way. Um, get the best that you can, you know? Get the best thing that you can afford. Get the thing that will help you make the quilts that you wanna make 
and don't apply all this emotion and judgment to it because all of that stuff is stopping you from being able to create. All of that stuff is stopping you from being able to make the quilts that you really want to make too. So I hope that this has helped uh, and certainly answered your questions about quilt, quilting and cheating. I don't consider anything a cheat. Uh, yes, we can get into some kind of convoluted ownership stuff and I want to dig more into that later. You know, I, I certainly want to hear from you. If you consider a quilt that's been quilted by someone else, does that kind of feel different to you? Uh, or does it still feel like 100% your quilt? Do you feel like you should be giving credit to someone else for quilting on a quilt show, at a quilt show, or not? I'd love to hear from you and get your opinion about that. Do you credit the person that put the binding on if you've ever done that before? Uh, so yeah, I'd love to hear more about this and your perspective and if there's ever been anything that you have considered quilt cheating over the years and why. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode and learned something new and I hope that it has encouraged you to widen your world and keep it as open as possible. It's very easy to shrink things down. It's very easy to say, oh, fusible web, that's cheating. You know, you can't, you can't glue things together. You need to needle turn everything. Well, there might be a day where you can't needle turn anymore. And then what will happen? Will you not do applique? If that's your favorite thing in the world to do, will you not do applique ever again? That's the thing, you know? I, I think that by leaving your world as open as possible, you will have the greatest ability to make quilts no matter where you are in your life, no matter what's going on, uh, and you'll have the greatest enjoyment of your craft as well. And that's really, I think, ultimately where it's at. I think that's the best thing. So just a quick reminder, we do have our heart medallion fabric on sale at leahday.com. Come and check it out and don't forget to use the coupon code podcast to save 10% on your order. I really hope that you are enjoying the podcast episodes and I hope that you'll share them with your friends so they can come and become a new quilting friend too. So come and check out all of the podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. Until next time, Let's go quilts.